Hey, thanks for joining us online at The Assembly. We believe in biblical teaching and preaching, and this message is designed to proclaim the hope of Jesus. So feel free to share this video with a friend or on your social media. And we would love to stay connected, so be sure to follow our channel. Hope this message encourages you. Thank you so much again for being here. Matthew 12, 21 says, and his name will be the hope of all the world. And that's exactly what the Lord's told us to be, is a place of hope. And so we hope that you uh, experience the presence of the Lord. Today is a very special day. And uh, before I introduce our guest speaker, who's going to come and just really minister to us today in a special way, I want to welcome our campus in Gentry. Uh, they're joining us live this morning. Can we welcome the assembly in Gentry this morning? It's great to have them. And also, I want you once again to welcome, we've, we've teamed up with Chaplain Pearson down at Tucker uh, Prison, Unit 1. Come on, let's welcome the men at Tucker Prison. Glad that you guys have joined us as well, and everyone else that's watching online and taking that opportunity. Now, I want to do something um, because this gentleman is a, is a friend of this church, and some of you have not had the privilege of meeting Rick Allen and so let me just share with you, and I'm going to read this because he has, he, he holds a lot of different influential positions. But in January 2013, Rick became the director of Light for the Lost, which is the evangelism resourcing arm of the Assemblies of God. Since its inception, Light for the Lost has raised more than $370 million to provide resources on five evangelistic platforms, print, audio, video, and internet technologies, and also phone apps. In January of 2016, Rick was appointed as the National Men's Ministries Director. Men's Ministries is focused on assisting men to be discipled, equipped, and go across America and around the world. Men's Ministries believes that men should be discipled, and, and they offer hundreds of free digital discipleship resources, training tools for men's groups, a monthly podcast, and a daily men's devotional through the Men's Ministry webpage and men's app. Men's Ministry has expanded the ministry by launching what is called the 360 Man Network, which includes 360 Discipleship, 360 Equip, and 360 Go. And Rick and his wife, Bev, reside just outside of Springfield, and they have two children, or two, children two grandchildren, and a puppy dog. <laughs> okay, that's official, but let me tell you about the Rick I know. Rick has impacted my life personally. He's impacted our life as a married, a married couple. He's impacted not just our lives, but uh, he has been on this journey of ours Crystal and I will celebrate being here going on 23 years coming up, and Rick has been on that journey. He, this is his first time of being with us since we've been in the new building here, and it's funny to say new building because we just celebrated five years being in this location last week. But from the time that we got here, he has been an ear that I've been able to call, text, and listen to. And what I just read to you is the official bio, and all of that is true, and he has made an impact across this nation. In fact, the men's Bible study that we are now in comes from our men's discipleship off our webpage, and tomorrow night's lesson, Rick, is the one that you wrote, Strength for Forgiveness, and uh, didn't know that, didn't plan that, and so, uh, but Rick is a dear friend of mine, he's a dear friend of this church. What I read is official. What I just said comes from my heart. Will you welcome my friend and our friend of the assembly, Rick Allen, our National Men's Director. Come on, let's welcome and give him honor this morning. Thank you, man. I love you. Love you, buddy. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, my joy. Thank oh, please be seated. Thank you. It is a joy to be at the assembly. Aren't you glad to be here? I'd rather be here than the best funeral home in town. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, you know what? I've checked out this pew. I am the best looking thing on this thing. Now, Bartlett, may I borrow $20? I am elated to be here. I must confess that I believe that your pastor and pastor's wife are some of the chosen righteous people of the kingdom. Your pastor, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
I've known this couple for a long time. In fact, I've known them when I didn't have gray hair. And, and, and while I'm bringing that up, let's just, just cut to the chase. I got to get where I can see you. Uh, if you're under 65, raise your hand. Raise it up high because you're young. Okay, I have one thing to say to all of you. Now, put your hands down. Now, if you're over 65, raise your hand. All of these people have one thing to say to you. Pay your taxes. We need your Medicare money. <laughs> Gary and Crystal Wheat are chosen friends. Not chosen by our choice, but chosen by the blood of Christ. Bev and I have been blessed by this congregation when we were missionaries. Bev and I have been blessed by Gary and Crystal's friendship. We have been blessed that we get to participate as a voice into pastor's heart. Uh, many times you don't realize the impact you have on people until someone says it to you. And you go, wait a minute, I thought we were just friends. But it is a joy. And you have, I believe, one of the greatest pastors in our nation. I travel around the nation every year. And Gary and Crystal Wheat, they are a tremendous testimony. They are pastor's hearts. And they love people. And when I heard about you guys going and cleaning up at the Dogwood Festival, I was like, that's scary. That's, and be sure you wear your assembly shirt. That's what he told me to tell you. And so, uh, but thank you so much for loving my friends, honoring my friends, and giving them a platform where their ministry for the kingdom of God can be used to multiply people around the world. What this church does has a global impact, and I want to thank you personally. Thank you. So, with that, I am ready to have some fun. How about you? Now, if you're at the Gentry campus, get ready to laugh because I'm going to walk all over this platform and I'm going to mess the cameramen up bad today, bad. If you're at Tucker, listen, thank you for being there. Thank you not for your crime, but thank you that you're in the chapel. Thank you that you're now allowing God to speak to you. Your journey is a difficult journey, but it's a journey that has a positive end if you'll just stay faithful until the end. And the Gentry Church, I'm excited about what you're doing. I heard you had 115 at Easter. That is fantastic and continue to grow. For the guests that are here at Gentry and for here, we thank you that you had a choice where you could be this morning. You chose to be here. And we're glad you're here. Thank you for allowing us to share Christ with you. And we pray that God speaks to your heart and that God does something phenomenal in your life. We believe that you're here for a divine appointment. You feel you may be here because your friends have invited you. And we're glad you're here. Please enjoy the day. Enjoy the presence of the Lord. And allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your life. But now it's time for us to begin to share God's word. If you have your Bibles I will, be, and you would like to turn them on or open them up, I'll be speaking out of John chapter 2, one of my favorite stories. Pastor and Crystal and I had the joy of eating supper together last night, and during that time we were just talking about our history, our past, our future. This church has always been good to Bev and I. Uh, when we became missionaries, this church helped us with all of our mission needs for our home. And we want, that was almost 21 years ago, right after you came. And then when we went to Springfield in 2005, Pastor and Pastor Crystal continued their friendship and connection with us, and they've just watched God do some miraculous things. And thank you, men, for using the men's website. I, got, I need to do this real quick, like while you're finding John chapter 2. Um, the National Men's Ministries, we are now in 42 countries of the world. And four different denominations use our ministry resources on our National Men's website. 
Uh, all of our website stuff is free. We have women using our stuff. We have children using our stuff, youth. Uh, we have Bible studies where you can study John. You can, there's a 37-week study on the Holy Spirit, and it's all free. And it's amazing for us to get emails and text messages and Facebook messages from Ghana and India and Vietnam and Russia saying that they're using the stuff. And every time they ask, they say, can you translate it for me? And I'm like, now listen, I, I wish I could, but there's like 8 billion people on the planet, and I, and I don't have that much money. And so, uh, but God is doing some phenomenal things, and thank you men for using it. John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And now both Jesus and the disciples were invited to the wedding. Now let me share with you a couple things as I get ready to tell you of interesting, two interesting stories today. Number one, Jesus, Cana is approximately... 70 miles north of Bethlehem, 60 miles north of Jerusalem, and about 7 miles north of Nazareth. This is up in the far north country. And for Jesus to start his miraculous ministry that far away from homeland is a little interesting to me. You think he would do it in Jerusalem. You think he would start his public ministry close to Bethlehem. But no, he goes up to Cana and he's not even supposed to be there because when Jewish women get married they get married on three days of the week Wednesday if they're a virgin Thursday if they're a widow and Saturday if they have permission from the priest and the mayor of the city to be married so this Sabbath wedding this these couples their parents have went to the priest they have went to the mayor they have received special permission. They're going to do it just out in the. They're going to do it out in the square. They're going to do it out in the city pavilion. And so this is a big thing. Like what's going to happen here with Dogwood Days? It's a big deal, and so they're out in this pavilion area, and then they they're celebrating everything that's going to happen. The wedding will happen somewhere around four o'clock on the end of the Sabbath. And at the end of the Sabbath at 6 p.m., the party begins. And only people, there are no wedding invitations sent out at a Sabbath day wedding. Every person in the city is invited to the reception. So just picture Siloam Springs. Number two, the party, the reception goes from Saturday night at sunset, the, beginning, the end of the Sabbath, to the beginning of the next Sabbath, which is Friday night at 6 o'clock. So the party goes from Saturday night to Friday night, and the two families are responsible for all the food and drink for the city. That's when you want to look at your daughter and go, baby, Wednesday sounds really good to me. <laughs> and with that, there's only two exceptions. Family members from outside the city can go to the Sabbath wedding. Or if you've been invited to help with the serving party for the one week, you get to come. And from the indication of the story, Mary is part of the serving party. And because she came, she gets to bring Jesus. And Jesus brings the posse. And that's how they end up there. It's kind of like the I before E except after C rule. I don't understand that rule. But it's there. Now, if you're an English teacher, you could explain it to me. Really don't want to hear about it. But we've got Mary, we have Jesus, we have the posse. Now, if you were raised in church, you understand like my wife understands church. My wife is part of that Gaither stuff. Her first cousin was singing with the Happy Goodmans and Johnny. And, and my wife plays the piano and she sings and she does all that stuff. And I just got to confess, it just makes me sick. I'm a jailbird singer. I'm behind a few bars still looking for a key. That's me. So she was raised in this stuff. Me, I was raised drug addict. Do I have a witness in the house? I never went to church. 
My mother's from Madrid, Spain. We were old-fashioned Catholics. We were CEO Catholics, Christmas, Easter only. That's when we went to Mass. And on a Saturday night in Little Rock, Arkansas, I have graduated from high school. I am sitting at a bar at 10th and Main, and I'm sitting with my two roommates. And my two roommates, one of my roommates, looked at me and said, you know, Rick, we're dumb. We are dumb. And I said, what are you talking about we're dumb? He said, we're sitting in this bar, spending our money, trying to pick up women, when you can go to church and pick up women for free. And I said, then what are we doing in this bar? And so we got up and left. And the next morning I got up and right down the street, not 500 yards from me, was a Pentecostal Assembly of God church. I don't know what Pentecost stands for. I don't know what Assembly of God stands for. And so I get dressed and my two roommates decide they chicken out. So I walk down. I want to go see. I'm going to go check this out. So I walk into that building, and there's about a 1,000 people in this building. Now, back then, I'm so skinny, I only have one stripe in my pajamas. I'm 120 pounds soaking wet. Yes, Jesus has been very good to me. <laughs> I have long hair down to my waist. It is in a ponytail. I am wearing corduroys in April. And I got a sweater vest on that makes, that makes me show off my muscles, i.e. 120 pounds. I don't have any muscles. And I walk into that building, and a thousand Pentecostals looked at me and went, ooh, fresh meat. <laughs> and I walked into the back of the building, and they started singing. And they sang and they sang, and they sang. Now, you old-timers, you gripe about these young kids, you better quit. We used to sing, he set me free for 45 minutes. <laughs> and if no one shouted, you didn't change the song, you just sang it faster. <laughs> and they sang, and then all of a sudden, this one guy jumps up. Now, if you're not familiar with Pentecost like I wasn't, it freaked me out. Some guy jumps up. And he runs to the wall, and I'm thinking, dear God, he's assuming the position. I got drugs in the car. I got to get out of here. I'll be arrested. And he runs to the wall, and everybody else starts running to the wall, and they start making this loop around the church. They start sitting there singing, he set me free, I fly away, everybody will be happy over there. And sometimes that's true because ain't nobody happy here. And so anyhow, and so they're walking around the building, and I'm like, what are they doing? I'm sitting here just, I'm a Catholic boy. I'm like, ha! Ah! And I turned to an old man sitting behind me, and I said, what are they doing? And he said to me, in the Bible. And I have learned since then, when someone starts with in the Bible, they don't know what they're talking about. They blaming Jesus, blame him. And he said, in the Bible, the children of Israel walked around the walls of Jericho seven times, and the walls came tumbling in. Huh? Huh? And I turned back around, and I started trying to figure out, who was the first person up, and what's the lap count? Because I'm out at six. I'm out. And I sit there, and I'm starting to figure it out, starting to watch. And I turned back to the old man and I said, excuse me, do you know the lap count? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, at six, I'm out. I don't know why they want the building to fall down. I don't know where they'll go to church next week. But when it happens, I don't want to be here. And he goes, oh, oh, the walls don't come tumbling down anymore. So I think I ask a pretty intelligent question. Then why are they walking? And he looked at me, I'll never forget this. This was my first Pentecostal truth. He looked at me, he goes, I don't know, sometimes I just get up and do this, you give it 10 minutes, everything will be fine. <laughs> and that's how it starts. Verse 3. 
And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus looks at the mother and says, mother, why do you want to concern me? My hour's not yet come. We misinterpret this a lot. While they're there at Cana, that's six days, six nights of partying. The families were responsible for the food and drink for the community, for the city. Mary knows that they have run out of wine, or they're close to running out of wine, and she knows that this will cause a great shame to the families that she's there helping. They will be put under a level one Jewish excommunication, which is called an item. An item is a 30-day pronouncement where the men shave their head, the family stands in sackcloth, they stand outside the synagogue gates, and they stand there and they ask people for forgiveness for embarrassing the, the, the synagogue. And Mary knows that this couple and this young married couple and all of this families that are connected do not need to be standing out there for 30 days, and she doesn't want them to because she loves them. And she knows she's only got one out. Jesus. And she goes up to him, contemplating something more severe than we see. And it is this. Son, they don't have enough wine. I don't want this family to go through the shame, the torture, and the pain. I don't want them to feel it. And Jesus respectfully says, Mom, why do you want to involve me? My hour's not yet come. This is what he's saying. Mom, I understand this this crisis with this family. I understand the shame that could be coming on this. But, Mom, if you ask me to do what you're asking me to do, you start the clock. And when you start the clock, you start it for my crucifixion. Do you want to love that family more than you want to love being with me? If you don't do this, I can live longer with you. We can start the clock later. But if you want me to start the clock now, you have to understand my days with you are numbered. Do you want to involve me? And Mary turns to the servants. And as I began to study more in the Greek on this, because of the pain of knowing that what she was about to do to save her friends was going to put her son at the ultimate death. It's always a sacrifice. Miracles do not come without sacrifices. And she turns to the servants and she says, whatever he says to do, you do it. See, there's always a time in the midst of a celebration where there's a point of destiny decision. For me, from that first service, I went back. And watch them. I was fascinated with Pentecostal calisthenics. I was. These people did all kinds of stuff. It was crazy. They were now they didn't have snakes. Let me just put that there. No snakes, no snakes, but a ton of tambourines. And I, to this day, I do not like tambourines. I mean, tambourines, if they're in heaven, I will be disappointed. Because most people who have tambourines, now, if someone plays a tambourine here, don't look at them right now. Don't look at them. But most people who play a tambourine can't play a tambourine. They can't keep time. And you're just like, shoot them. Just help them. They, there's got to be medicine for this.
Mm. And so for six months I went. And I would go and watch, laugh, and have fun in the back. We were in a revival with a, a gentleman by the name of Don Brankel. It was a Wednesday afternoon, and we were going to go up to my place of business. I was a mechanic by trade, and we were going, me and a friend were going to go get some stuff, and then we were going to go back down to the church, play a little basketball, and get ready for church. We pulled up to a four-way stop sign in North Rock, Arkansas, Lakewood and McCain. I pulled up to that four-way stop sign at that time, and a 1969 Z28 Camaro pulled up next to me. And they went, boom! I just had to wake some of you up. And I looked over them in my 1972 baby blue Ford Pinto. And I went, mm. <laughs> and they went, boom. And I went, mm. and I told the guy who was with me, I said, they do it one more time, they're in trouble. Because what they didn't know and what you don't know is that we had taken out that 2,000 cylinder, four cylinder, CC engine and dropped a 351 Cleveland inside that Pinto. Had to cut the inside fender walls out to get that bad boy in there. Had to redo the whole drive shaft. I mean, we had to put weight in it to keep it from flying in the air. I almost was with the Wrights brothers on this thing. <laughs> and they did it one more time, and I hit the switch. My drop-down headers flow, and I went, Whoo! and I was gone. And I was flying through that 30 mile an hour speed limit. You might as well turn that clock off. We're not leaving. And when you said, and so you, you got zero up there. It's been zero a long time. I don't care. It won't mind. I travel all over the world. That clock's not going to bug me. They're back there going, he got eight minutes. Well, that's when I get to point three. And so now they're back there going, oh, Jesus, we're in trouble. We are in so much trouble. Uh, so anyhow, I, and I top a little hill, I'm going through a residential area, 30 miles an hour, top a little hill, and there's a 1967 Buick Electra 225, deuce and a quarter. If you don't know what that is, it's an aircraft carrier on wheels. And I hit that car at 110 miles an hour. I disintegrated my Pinto. I mean, disintegrated it. They told me I could get my, I could have my car. And I said, what do you mean I could have my car? I ended up in the hospital for two days. They said, we'll bring your car to you. I said, how do you bring a car to a hospital? They brought my under-dash eight-track tape player. Hello? How many know what I'm talking about? Eight-track. Come on, raise your hand. Now, listen, you little, you young people born under, that are under 40, you make me sick. <laughs> you make me sick. Y'all got a telephone that plays a 1,000 records. You got TV with 250 channels. And my grandson, I don't have nothing to watch. Oh, shut up. <laughs> when I was growing up, it was ABC, NBC, and that's all we got. They said a fourth channel was coming. PBS, come to find out it's puppets. I don't need puppets. Back then, you had to play, you, you, you would play your favorite song. You'd get on the strip and play your song. Then you had to drive through the backwoods for 10 minutes for your favorite song to come back on that eight-track tape player. Man. And I hit that car. Messed up the C3 and 4 vertebrae in my neck. I end up in the Baptist Medical Center on Wednesday afternoon. I signed seven tickets. I don't remember them. I don't remember that night. And I woke up on Thursday morning in a bed in a semi-private room. I have a portable halo on. And I can see motion in the other bed. And I go, hey, where am I? And a man sits up on the edge of the bed. And he points at me and he goes, boy, are you saved. And he reaches up and he grabs the curtain and he closes it. 
And I started talking to him. Hey, I want to talk to you about that salvation stuff. I want to talk to you. I've been going to church. My, I haven't had the courage to make it my appointed time. I haven't had the courage to have my, my hours come. I'm, too, I, I, I'm a coward. He never talked to me. I buzzed the nurse. The nurse came into the room. She said, what's the matter? I said, that man in that room, in that bed right over there, will, I, the reason I'll never be a Christian is because that man in that bed asked me if I'm saved, and now he won't talk to me. She pulled the mirror out of the tray, pulled the curtain back. I looked in the mirror, and that bed was perfectly made. There was no one in that bed. Don't do that to a drug addict. It messes them up. I laid there all day trying to figure out where that man went. Friday morning, my spirit-filled doctor comes in. And I told him, tonight's the last night of revival. I want to go. He says, walk to the end of the hallway and back. And I walked to the end of the hallway and back. He said, you can go, but you got to be back by 11 because the nurses will change at 11. And they, the next group doesn't know what's happening, but you can go. So all my agenda for the day was this. I got to be back by 11 for two reasons. I need to get saved, and I need the Jello. They're going to serve Jello at 930, and I want it. I'm a bachelor. You got to enjoy it. I go to the church. I sit on the third row, and they sang and they sang, and they sang. I had this portable halo on. It's a big foam thing. It's got suctions on my head. I'm just, I'm just frozen. I don't know what Pastor Frankel preached that night. I just know I was ready to go. Nearby stood six stone water pots, the kind used for the purification of water. And Jesus said, go get me those six pots. And the servants knew that he shouldn't get those pots. He, the servants knew that those pots were in the purification cycle. The purification cycle was a 20-day process. What happens in drinking water, what they would do is they would have big drinking pots out there in the area of the vest uh, out there in the parks and things where we be community water and what they would do is they would fill a pot up to the bottom of a brim it looked like a like a trash can with a flower pot on the top and they would fill it to the bottom of the brim and it was made out of stone and what they would do is they would put the water in on friday and let the water sit all day saturday if the water was down, uh, and then on Sunday, they would skim the top of the water for one week twice a day. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday morning, Monday night, Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, all the way up to Friday night when the start of the next Sabbath, and they would let the water sit for another 24 hours. And then on that Sunday morning, they would skim the water again, and then they would put a ladle on the jug. That told the people of the community they could drink the water, putting the ladle on. And no matter if the, if, the, if the barrel of water got emptied down to a foot on a Monday, it would just sit like that till Friday, but they would remove the ladle, which tells people that water's impure. The really cool thing about what God did with water is that to have buoyancy, you have to have artificial assistance. Everything that's in water will either sink or float. And then they would put the ladle on it, and they would use the ladle till the water got down to a foot or so from the bottom. Then they would remove the ladle, wait for Friday, wash the pot out, flip the pot over upside down so the sun could cure the inside of the pot. And it would sit there for a week, and then they would flip it back over and start the process. Those pots have just been cleaned out yesterday. They are flipped upside down, and there's more than six. And Jesus says, go get me six water pots. And they know they can't touch those pots. Those pots are in the cleaning cycle. But the mother said, whatever he says to do, do it. So they go get six pots. They bring them to Jesus. 
Jesus says, now fill them up to the brim. Fill them up to the, t- to the very top. And they're going, we can't fill it to the top. Because if you fill the water to the top, when the water splashes over, it gets on the outside of the stone. The stone gets hot, the water gets hot, and you can't drink it. you got to keep the outside of the stone dry so the water stays cool. But your mama said, so they fill them to the top. Then Jesus says, take a ladle and dip it out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they're like, we didn't even skim the junk off the top. We haven't taken anything off this at all. None. But your mama said to do this. So they do it. They take the ladle, they give it to the master. The master drinks it and goes, this is the best wine I've ever tasted here. Usually you bring the good wine out first and then you give out the cheap wine as the week goes on. You've saved the best till now. Miracles always need preparation. Miracles will need a sacrifice. And also, multiple miracles happen inside big miracles. There are seven miracles that happen when Jesus turns the water into wine. The first one is that he turns the water into wine at the wrong place, at the wrong time. He's in Cana. He's at a wedding of people he really doesn't know. He's there because his mom has asked him to come with her. Number two, Jesus has to put a protector between the stone pot and the water. So when he turns the water into wine, the stone won't make the pot acidic and the wine sour to drink. So he has to put a film between the pot and the water. Third miracle, he has to take the dirty water and make it pure water. The purer the water, the purer the wine. The fourth miracle that Jesus does is he turns the pure water into wine. The fifth miracle he does is that those six water pots will supply the wine for the rest of the celebration. They will go for the rest of the week. Whether he turned the water on Monday or Thursday, whatever he did, whenever he did it, these six pots will supply Cana with the wine for the rest of the week. Number six, and I think this is very fascinating. At the time that Jesus is with the disciples... He has only called six disciples. Six of the disciples never saw the the miracle at Cana. They only heard about it. So when God does a miracle in this house, it's important that the people who weren't in the house hears about the miracle in the house. Because if we're just going to hold it in and not share it with our community then God will not move the miracle in the house. Because the seventh miracle is this. It had nothing to do with water pots. It had nothing to do with wedding. It had everything to do with John 2.11. This is the first of the miraculous signs that Jesus will perform in Cana of Galilee. The disciples will put their trust in him and he will reveal his glory. The glory of the Lord is the third dimension of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There is the anointing of the heart. You ever been in a grocery store, talked to somebody, started having a Jesus conversation? You're in the first level of the anointing, the anointing of the heart. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I'm in the midst. Have you ever been in a service where pastors preached and you've had revelation knowledge? You can't get fresh vision. You can't have a fresh understanding unless you get fresh revelation. And sometimes people teach you things and you go, that's a fresh revelation. And that fresh revelation brings fresh vision. The third level of the anointing is the glory of the Lord. And that's when the glory of the Lord resonates on the people's flesh. 
Their heart is sinless. Their mind is receptive to the teachings of the Lord. Therefore, their body becomes a slave to their heart and mind, and they worship. I used to tell my congregation, you're responsible for two things. You're responsible for the beginning of the service. God inhabits the praises of the people. More people that inhabit the praise, the more important it is. See, when our guests come into our church, I used to tell them, they will listen to the pulpit. They're going to watch the pews, and they're going to make their decision on whether or not they come back on what they see, not what they hear. The glory of the Lord. And the fourth level is the awakening. And the awakening only happens when the people allow the glory to fill the house every service. And at the end of the service, I used to tell my church, when people are coming down here to get saved, nobody gets to leave. You all got to stay. Because if they have had their name written down in the Lamb's back book of life, this is why Jesus died. And they stand up and there's eight paid people standing there and 500 people have walked out to go eat lunch. They understand salvation is not important. The congregation doesn't believe it. So I'm begging you, if you don't have an appointment, stay. Because the Holy Spirit moves in waves. And if you stay and continue to worship the Lord, he will move and God will do great things. And our church went from 60 to 650 in two years, two and a half years. Because of the people. The altar call came. And I realized I don't want to be the first person down there. If I'm the first person down there, they're going to shake me because we're a raggedy and praying church. You know what a raggedy and praying church is? They grab your head and they shake you like a raggedy and doll. And I got this brace on. I'm thinking, they're going to shake my head. They're going to snap my neck. I will be dead and I'll stand before Jesus going, living for you is the toughest seven seconds of my life. So I wanted to be second. All of a sudden, a little Mexican boy came down, white T-shirt, blue jeans, Chuck Converse tennis shoes, knelt down at the prayer at the communion table. I sprinted down to the right side over here, and that night I found out people, they know how to pray at you. They don't know how to pray with you. They told me to spit it up, cough it up, bark at the dog, moon like a dog. They yelled at me, stand up, sit down, cry, 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 yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm confused. It's like putting me in a round room telling me to sit in a corner. And finally, this little old lady came up to me, Sister Lewis. She said, does anybody pray the prayer of salvation with you? I said, no, ma'am, they prayed everything but. She said, let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. And we go through the whole thing. We get to the end of it. And she says, and in the name of Jesus. And when she said, in the name of Jesus, pow! I had to wake the rest of you up. Sounded like a gun went off in that building. And I jumped up and turned around because I thought the guys I owed drug money to had shot me in my sinner's prayer. And that's not right. They could have waited. And I turned around and spun and looked at the back door and there was nobody there. And all of a sudden, everyone in this building, I don't understand it. I am not aware of this. I feel this sensation start coming over my body. And it just starts dripping and it's hot. And as it, as it soothes through me, I just want to stand there. I want it to take its time. I just stood there. And as it gets down to my torso, I can remember grabbing the brace and taking the brace off and moving my neck as it was going down. And I realized that the pal I heard was not a gunshot. It was God healed my neck instantly. And my neck is healed. And I am saved and I am healed. And I get ready to open my mouth and tell somebody, I feel great. And I turn to look at someone and I get ready to open my mouth. And when I open my mouth, I am speaking in tongues. I'm speaking in another language, a heavenly language that I don't even believe in. And I'm saved and I'm healed and I'm filled. And at that moment, I was delivered. I was delivered from drugs. I was delivered from alcohol. Delivered from speech. 
deliberate. My whole countenance changed. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You are a new creature in Christ. It happened. And I was elated. And I stood up and pastor knows the family. And Brother Johnson was walking away from me. And I had been a, I had been a, a bear for six months. And I said, Brother Johnson, Brother Johnson, thank you for putting up with me. He says, man, Rick, just try to be at church Sunday. Just try to be at church Sunday. And I said, but Brother Johnson, I want to know where that person was in the altars. I want to thank them because they didn't come down. I wasn't coming down. And he said, Rick, and he's kind of walking away from me, and he's kind of looking back at me. He said, Rick, there was no one in the altars but you tonight. And I said, don't do that to me. I said, that happened yesterday in the hospital. He goes, I'm sorry, but there's no one. I said, Brother Johnson, it was a little Mexican boy. And when I said that, Guys, he was just, and he just stopped. I said he was a little Mexican boy. He had on a white t-shirt. Little chubby little boy. Had on blue jeans. And Brother Johnson turns around and goes, did he have on Chuck Converse tennis shoes? And I said, yes, sir, he did. He said, sit down. And I thought, man, I'm in trouble. How did I get in trouble? And he sat down. And he took his jacket off and he put it on my shoulders. And I thought, praise God, I'm saved and won a jacket. This ain't bad. <laughs> and he told me this. About six years ago, Rick, I came to church on a Sunday morning. I went and unlocked the door. I felt a tug on my jacket. It was a little Mexican boy, white t-shirt, blue jeans, Chuck Converse tennis shoes. I said, mister, can anybody come to this church? He said, yeah, anybody can come to this church. And if you want, I'll come pick you up in a car. He said, I turn around, Rick, and unlock the door. And I looked back, and he was gone. I went into the parking lot. I looked down Allen Street. I looked down 47th Street. I couldn't find the boy. And I was disappointed because I was thinking, man, I got a little boy coming to church. Maybe I can get his family to come to church. He said, I unlocked the door, and I walked into the lobby of the church. And when I walked into the lobby of the church, he said, it's one of the two times I would heard God speak to me. He said, Doyle, you've just seen an angel. There will be a day where a young man will see the same angel you've seen. Anoint him. He has a powerful work for me to do. And he looks at me. Now, remember, I'm 120 pounds soaking wet. I got a ponytail. And he looks at me. He goes, you don't even look like what I'm looking for but you're the one. And he grabbed one of those big bottles of oils. Now, you old-time Pentecost people, you know what I'm talking about. We got all these little bottles now. We were talking about back then. And he went and grabbed it and started shaking it. And I thought, dear God, he's activating that bad boy. I don't know what's in it, but this is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. And he's shaking it, and he, and he pops the top, and he dumps the whole bottle over my head, all over me. And he begins to prophesy, young man, you who, knew, you who know no scripture will be an advocate and ambassador for God's word around the world. You will reach millions of people you will never see. Your impact will be felt for generations to come. You're going to be someone who God's going to use to do mighty things through people in the church. And he starts giving me this prophecy. And he lays it all out. I don't even know what he's talking about. I have no concept of what he's saying. I don't know what prophecy is. And yet, everything he said to me that night, I'm seeing come to pass. He looked at me and said, from this day forward, you will be my son, I will be your father. And as I studied this story, you start the clock, Mom, I leave early. She starts the clock. And at the cross, Mom, I know you started the clock, but Mom, I need to tell you something. See, John, he's your son. John, see Mary, she's your mom. Take care of her because I'm not going to leave her nor forsake her. Because she took a step of faith. Your miracle is in what can you sacrifice? What are you courageous enough to walk for? What are you willing to stand for? And are you ready 
for God to move in you today when you weren't prepared for God to move today. As the band comes to the stage, I want to ask one simple question at 1118. How bad do you want your miracle? I waited six months. I could have missed it. Some of you may take that six months and go, you know what? I'll have another chance. Maybe. If you're here and you're needing a medical miracle, a financial miracle, a, a physical healing, you need a mental healing, I am surprised at the number of people who are just worn out because of COVID. If you're here and you need God to do something supernatural in your life today, and you're saying today could be the day, I want you to stand to your feet in the next 15 seconds. Go. You have 15 seconds. This is not something you contemplate or when God starts moving, you try to run down to get on the tail end of it. You got to step up. If you have grandchildren who are running from God, you need to be standing up because that's your legacy. If you have children running from God, you need to be standing. You, that's your seed. I love what Pastor said today about the seeds in the row and marking. Remember this, harvest comes naturally when seed is planted correctly. When you plant seed correctly, harvest comes. Yeah, I have good news for you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. Doesn't matter if you have cancer, an ingrown toenail, a financial issue, a job-related issue that you can't take the stress or your business is about to go under. Whatever your miracle is, remember this. You're not here for the miracle. This was something I had to get in my spirit. I am not here for God to do the miracle in me. I am here for God's glory to flow through me. And as God's glory flows through me, my flesh will worship him. My heart will be receptive. My mind will be appeared. And I will become the receptacle for the miracle if God so chooses to bring it. But I'm not here waiting to see if he's going to touch my body. I'm here to give him the glory. So I'm going to ask you to do your second step of courage, and that is step out from your seat and come and stand across the front. Prayer team, if you're here, come on up. Be sure you have a bottle of oil. Hallelujah. Come on, make room. Just keep scooting down if you don't mind. I've asked Austin the worship team. I want us to sing something everybody knows. Now hear me, those of you, the most, I think the most important players in this round is those still sitting. God inhabits the praises of his people. And those of us, I used to tell my congregation, those of us that are sitting and just in the waiting in the presence of the Lord, if we can become the praise warriors for God to inhabit our praises, it opens the scope of miracles for the Holy Spirit to move in. But if we only sit here and watch, we close the door and God has a very small door to move through. We. So I'm going to ask you that are sitting, if you don't mind standing, and when Austin and the team starts worshiping, those of you at Gentry, we want you to do the same. Those of you that are at Tucker this afternoon, listen, God can do a miracle in your life. Don't give up on you yet. God has it. That's why you're watching this. I love you, man. You're going to do good. Gentry, allow the Holy Spirit to move there. 
God's no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of place. He's everywhere. Heavenly Father, we are now standing in your presence. We are asking you, Lord, to flow in the glory of the Lord. May your glory fill this house. May your people demonstrate your glory. May they be representatives of the power of God as they worship you with an unbridled tongue, with an open receptive heart, and a mind that acknowledges that what they're singing is true and faithful, and they believe that God, you are going to be the God of miracles as your glory fills the house. For those that are in the altars, may your glory minister to them prior to them receiving your touch. Now, Lord, we ask that you move by your spirit. Everybody stretch your hands. Those of you prayer team begin to start laying hands on your friends and praying for them. Worship team begin to sing and allow the glory of the Lord to fill this house. Again, thank you so much for joining us online at the assembly. We hope this message encouraged you and we would love to stay connected. So be sure to click the link below and contact us. We look forward to seeing you this Sunday.